Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please, we apologize for the delay in commencing the program as we should. While we wait for the dignitaries to arrive, we shall be acknowledging some of the guests that have come here already. By doing so, we'll buy time and be not left behind in the program. Uh, let me welcome the representative of the Bongom of Jos, who is represented by the Ata Ateng of Ganawuri in Riom local government area. Uh, Baba is already seated on the high table. Please, a round of applause for him. We also have our own here, the Gomrue of Kuru, who is our host, Da Patrick Mandum. Baba, welcome. We are very pleased to also announce the officials of the Alumni Association of the National Institute. Uh, we have Malam. Abubakar Ismail Isa MNI, who is the Secretary General of ANI. Sir, you are welcome. He is accompanied also by Brigadier General Retired SK Usman Kukasheka MNI. Welcome, sir. He is somewhere around. Uh, we have Dr. Bala Mohammed Abubakar the National Vice President, Nigerian Association of Chambers of Commerce, Industry, Mines, and Agriculture. Please, a round of applause for our guests. We have Mrs. Rivkatu Daniel, the Zonal Director, NTA, Network Center in Jos, representing the DG NTA Comrade Salu Mohammed Mambes. Please, a round of applause for you, Madam. Welcome. We have the co commander, Sector Command of the Federal Road Safety Commission, who is also here representing the co-marshal of the Federal Road Safety Commission. Please, a round of applause for him, too. We shall keep acknowledging our guests as they come in. Police ban, please. Police ban.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have in our midst also Reverend Dr. David Poffey, who is the chaplain of the Chapel of Salvation, Nips Kuru. Please, a round of applause for him. There is also Engineer Usman Abubakar, the Federal Controller of Works, Plateau State, is representing the Minister of State for Works. Please, a round of applause for him. Please wave if we call your name. Thank you. Please join me also in welcoming I, Inspector General of Police, MD Abubakar Retired, CFR, NPI, and MNI. He is the president of the Alumni Association of the National Institute Kuru. Participants, please clap for him again. Welcome, sir. The representative of the Controller of Immigration Services is represented by Christopher Nombwangi. Please, a round of applause for him too. Uh, this, this is to, to the participants, participants graduating participants. participants. You, you are entitled to only one yearbook. So those of you who have taken two, please return them because your colleagues would not get them. You can make special arrangement for an additional copy if you want, but not the ones that are distributed today. Thank you. We have also in our midst engineer Saeed Ujida, FNSE, FIOD, MNI, the Jarumin Rubadu, Jarumin, Nigeria. Please, can we give him a round of applause? DCM Joshua Fanola, MNI. I'm sorry, he is one representing the co marshal of the Federal Road Safety Commission. Uh, he is here, please. Can you please give him a round of applause? Welcome, Welcome sir. The Inspector General of Police is represented by D.I.G. Obonaya Amadi, M.N.I. Please, a round of applause for him. We have also another royal father, Dr. Shehu Audu, the Baju to Emir of Mambila, Plateau in Adamawa State. Please give him a round of applause. We also have Alaji Isa Wasa, who is representing the SGF, Mustafa Boss. Round of applause for him, please. He's seated there already.
Engineer Sunday Yat MNI, the head of civil service of Plateau State, is here too. Please round of applause for him. Um, your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we shall now rise for the national anthem. After the national anthem, we shall remain standing for one minute in honor of the soul of one of the participants who died during the course. Dr. Mrs. Deborah Zoaka. The national anthem, please.
May her soul rest in peace. Please be seated. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Yemi Osibanjo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, GCON, represented by the Honorable Minister for Labor and Employment, Dr. Chris Ingige, Your Excellency, the Governor of Plateau State, the Right Honorable Bar Barrister Samuel Lalong, KSGG, CON, Executive Governor of Plateau State, Chairman, the Presidential Campaign Council, Your Royal Highness Alaji Adu Bayero, Aminu Bayero, CFR, the Royal Father, the Bongwom of Jos, Da Dr. Jacob Gang Buba, represented by the Atta Ateng of Ghana Wuri, Riom in Plateau State, General Loki Irabo, the Chief of Defense Staff, and Acting Chairman, the Board of Governors of the National Institute Kuru, other heads of paramilitary organizations here in Jos. The Director General of NIPS, Professor Ayo Omotayo, other Chief Executives of Sister Institutions in Plateau State, the General Officer Commanding the Third Armored Brigade of the Nigerian Army, Rukuba, spiritual and religious leaders here present, the President of the Alumni Association of the National Institute, Kuru, and other members of the Alumni Association here present, management and staff and principal officers of the National Institute, members of the directing staff, senior fellows, fellows of the National Institute, distinguished graduating participants and your spouses, respected invited guests, members of the media, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. In order to start this program, may I invite the Director General of the Institute, Professor Ayo Omotayo, to deliver his welcome address. Mr. Chairman, sir, His Highness the Emir of Kano, I want to welcome you and I want to seek your indulgence that because um, we are starting a little bit behind schedule that we skip, uh, we skip other protocols and um, stand on the existing ones that have been laid down so that we can start as quickly as we can. Uh, we still have a few other programs for today, so we will not be uh, following too much protocols after the ones we have laid down. But be that as it may, I want to thank everyone that has come in here, uh, starting with um, the Vice President, who unfortunately is unable to come here because he is indisposed. And I want to thank the Honorable Minister, for finding the time. Actually, I know you created the time to come, Honorable Minister. I want to most sincerely thank you for coming to honor our invitation and then also delivering the speech of Mr. Vice President. I want to thank the Deputy Governor of Plateau State, who is representing 
uh, the, His Excellency, the Governor of Plateau State, who unfortunately also is not here, but has to attend to some other pressing state uh, issues. So I thank you for coming, finding the time to come. I also have uh, the representative of the Bongbom, sir, thank you for coming. And of course, our ever reliable and ever dependable chairman of ANI, uh, the former IG himself, MD Abubakar, sir, I thank you for coming. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is the second in one of those, uh, is the second of our programs for this graduation event. Yesterday we were all at the State House to present our report to Mr. President at what we call the Presidential Party. And I'm sure for those of us who follow the news, you would have heard that um, the presentation was well received. And of course, members of SEC 44, the participants of SEC 44 2022, those who knew what they signed up for, were able to deliver. I do not want us to have a cold day. I know we are all tired. So let's, let us please clap for uh, participants of SEC 44 2022. Uh, they have come, they have seen, but I don't know if they have conquered. <laughs> When we had the Ani dinner yesterday, you do, don't forget, they told you that you only have the M, you have the N, and that the I is not there yet. But I believe that we are gradually getting to the end of the program. I congratulate you all in advance, and I want to believe that this lecture, which of course you are supposed to listen to, engage with this lecture and of course we may also be asking you questions based on what the minister is going to read on behalf of Mr. President and anybody who is unable to reflect properly and engage with the lecturer may not get the eye at the end of the day. So I want to wish that you listen properly and be ready to listen to this lecture. Uh, I thank everybody that has come. I know that the service chiefs have always supported us, the IG has always supported us, uh, they have all sent representatives, and I think for all that the military has always done for the institute and the police force, so I wish that those people will stand, those of you representing the service chiefs, can you please stand up and let us give a round of applause once more. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Everywhere I've gone, I've always uh, recognized uh, the importance and the contribution of the military to the institute. That's why I said you should stand up once more for recognition. And of course, you know that they are the ones who are protecting us. I, I, I joked earlier with the representative of the chief of army staff that eventually they have returned our APC. Okay, I want to thank you for returning the APC. Uh, members of Sec 44, I'm sure you felt safe even without the APC being here. But now with the APC being returned, we know that we feel all, we all feel safer. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave this podium and I'm going to let the uh, compare continue with this work. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much, the Director General. Uh, we shall take two uh, remarks or addresses, one by the chairman of this occasion, which is the Highness, His Highness, the Emir of Kano, and then the Governor of Plateau State, before the distinguished speaker comes on board. So may I request His Highness, the Emir of Kano, to please give us his remarks.
اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم و صلی اللہ علی نبی الکریم یو ایکسلنسی the vice president ably represented represented by me my minister his excellency the executive governor of plateau state ably represented it represented by his deputy the dg the chairman of the alumni i always call him my commissioner of police though he turned out to be the IG later but I still refer to him as commissioner because he happens to be the most famous commissioner of police in Kano State. <laughs> Other distinguished guests, too numerous to mention that I have high regards for. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum. It gives me great pleasure to be at this year's distinguished annual lecture of the National Institute, which is being delivered by no less a person than the BP, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Osimbajo, ably represented by the Minister. A highly celebral academic astute statesman in the fatigable double servant leader eminent legal practitioner and quintessential gentleman indeed when i was invited to be the chairman of this important occasion i was deeply elated not only because the national institute represents the ideals of excellence which must be the bedrock of our national identity but also because of the quality of the guest speaker and the opportunities that this lecture provides for intellectual engagement to enrich the conversation around the bringing development to the grassroots and ensuring that no one is left behind in our quest for sustainable national development. The theme of this year's Distinguished Annual Lecture is Sub-National Level Governance in Africa. Rethinking New Policies, Framework and Institutions. And I believe this theme is both appropriate and relevant as it provides a platform for us to interrogate the perceived over centralization of powers especially in nations like Nigeria where there are, there are concerns about the effective and equitable distribution of scarce resources for the socio-economic development of all citizens. There is no doubt that we need to strengthen governance at the local level and allow the so-called dividends of democracy to cascade to the grassroots. It is perhaps for this reason that President Muhammad Buhari task the participants of Senior Executive Course 44 with the mandate of providing answers to the challenges of local governance in the country while providing options and actionable recommendations for the consideration by the government. The nexus between effective local government governance and achievement of sustainable development has gained ascendancy in global discourse. This has led governments of various countries to shift emphasis to development strategies, programs and projects that recognize the inputs and participation of the citizens at the grassroots. Nigeria cannot afford to be left behind in this important endeavor. 
indeed some of our recent challenges, including rising poverty, banditry, insurgency, and political agitations stem mainly from an even distribution of resources and widening inequality in the society. A well-developed system of subnational governance will not only help us to address these challenges, it will also contribute to the attainment of these sustainable development goals. Among other things, we need to adopt, adopt an effective decentralization policy that, pro, pro, that properly positions the local governments as a key factor in our national development aspirations. This will imply a reasonable level of political and physical autonomy with restricted interference from the top, which will, help, which will certainly help local governments to dispense their functions more effectively. I must, of course, commend the government for the various policies, institutional and legal frameworks that have recently been put in place to promote development in the country. This include the Agricultural, Agricultural Transformation Policy 2016, which places emphasis on providing a conducive legislative and agricultural knowledge framework, macro policies, security enhancing physical infrastructure, and institutional mechanisms for coordination and enhancing access to adequate inputs, finance, information, innovation, agricultural services and markets. According to the policy document, the go forward federal priorities in partnership with the state governments will be the following four. Food, security, import substitution, job creation, and economic diversification. This will no doubt have positive implications for inclusive development in the country. There is also the National Development Plan 2021 to 2025 which is a medium-term blueprint designed to unlock the country's potentials in all sectors of the economy for a sustainable, holistic, and inclusive national development. In its implementation, the policy aims for inclusiveness, participation, and citizen engagement to ensure, to ensure no one is left behind. It is my candid belief that with initiatives such as this, our desire to attain great lofty heights in the Committee of Nations will no longer be a dream, but an evident reality. We must, however, be ready to put aside our differences and work together as a people towards the realization of our national development aspirations. Thank you and God bless. Uh, thank you very much, Your Highness. We'll now invite the representative of the 
Executive Governor of Plateau State, Professor Sonny Guanle Tioden, to deliver his remarks. of uh, the DG given the time constraint and respect the protocol as already established but I think uh, protocol also demands that I recognize a few people starting with uh, the representative of his Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, represented by our Honorable Minister for Labor, the Chairman of the occasion, His Eminence Al Haji Aminu Adobairo, the Emir of Kano, the DG himself needs to be recognized, the chairman of, uh, was it president of ANI, but most important, I think uh, the participants need to be recognized, and I so recognize you. I bring you greetings and apologies from His Excellency the Governor of Plateau State, Right Honorable Simon Bakula along. He would have loved to be here himself. And as uh, the management of NIPS would uh, attest, he has, not, he has never missed an occasion like this. Any occasion in NIPS, unless he's out of the country or out of town, he always wants to be here. But unfortunately, this one is not able to be here because of the many caps he's currently wearing. I believe you, you know some of those caps. So he delegated me to represent him, and I give you his greetings. And particularly, he said I should congratulate the participants. Having spent 11 to 12 months of hard work, hard academic work, which most, some of them may have forgotten some years back, is not easy. So having come to this stage of, your, of, the, of, of participation, since you are participants, you said I should congratulate you. And I so congratulate you. <clears throat> having said that, I want to appreciate the management of NIPS itself for the choice of the topic that you handled, the issue of efficient governance at the local government level. I mean, for anybody who has the slightest knowledge of governance in Nigeria, would appreciate the fact that one area that we have not been able to, you know, uh, put it right is at the local government level. And it is unfortunate that we have not been able to do that because that is where the bulk of our people are located by nature. So the topic you have chosen and the topic you dealt with is quite apt and appropriate. And I believe it has exposed all of you, for those of you who may not have any first-hand knowledge of local government administration, it must have exposed you to the nitty-gritty of what goes on at that level. But I think the most important thing is not the, exp the exposure you had. We'll be interested in the recommendations that will be coming out from your work. And it is my hope and the hope of the governor 
that the recommendations that have emerged from your one year study should not only be left on the shelves of the federal government, you did that of the federal government yesterday. I believe the next thing is to see that the recommendations are circulated to all state governments and all local governments in this country. Because <coughs> I think it would be meaningless if the recommendations just end at the federal level. They should go to where they will be effectively implemented. On this note, I want to once again thank you for this opportunity and I want to appreciate the management of NIFS again for the synergy that has existed between them and us and between them and the surrounding community. I had occasion to be here some time ago and I mentioned the fact that one thing that has made me quite proud of the management of needs is the fact that despite all the security challenges we have been going through on the plateau, never for once was NIPS closed. The fact that they maintain activities irrespective of the challenges showed they appreciated the circumstances and also didn't want to play into the hands of uh, people who were creating the security challenges we had. It is my prayer and hope that this synergy, this brotherhood will continue between us and the management. As a government, we'll continue to do the best we can to create the, ne the necessary environment for effective uh, studies and for other activities. I wish you a happy occasion and for the participants as you depart, please go with good memories of Plateau State. And you are welcome back anytime. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. Uh, we have come to the crux of the matter now. Before the distinguished speaker comes to deliver a speech, may I invite Mrs. Sarah Abo, an assistant director in the Institute, to present a citation of our distinguished speaker. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm Sandra Agbo. I will be taking the citation on His Excellency Professor Oluyemi Oluleke Oshimbajo, S-A-N, G-C-O-N, the 2022 National Institute Distinguished Annual Lecturer and Vice President, Federal Republic of Nigeria. I seek permission kindly from the high table to be allowed to stand on the already established protocol. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my great privilege and honor to present an abridged citation of the 2022 Distinguished Annual Lecturer of the National Institute, who is also the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshimbajo, S-A-N-G-C-O-N. Presenting the citation of such a lofty and an accomplished personality is indeed a huge task. The assignment is, however, made relatively easy because our distinguished honor lecturer is a household name, notably as an erudite scholar, legal luminary, consummate teacher, outstanding public servant, compassionate pastor, and a gentleman. His Excellency is married to his half trope Oludolapo Oshimbajo, a grand, I'm a granddaughter of late statesman, Chief Obafemi Awolowo. The marriage is blessed with three children and a grandson. To start from the very beginning, Oluyemi Oluleke Oshimbajo was born on Friday, March 8, 1957 in Lagos to the family of Okwe Oluwa Oshimbajo. Young Oshimbajo attended Corona Primary School, Lagos, 
and thereafter proceeded to the famous Ibobi College here at Lagos between 1969 to 1975, coming out with flying colors. He gained admission to study law at the University, at the University of Lagos in 1975 and obtained a bachelor's degree in law, LLB, with a second class upper division in 1978. In 1980, Oshimba studied at the prestigious London School of Economics and Political Science, where he backed a master's degree in law, LLM. His professional life. In 1994, through hard work and commitment to scholarship, Osimbajo rose to the enviable rank of professor of law. He was appointed head of Department of Public Law, University of Lagos from 1997 to 1999, between 1999 and 2007. Oshibajo was member of cabinet of Lagos State Government, where he served as Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice. In 2007, Oshibajo became senior partner at Simon Scooper Partners Nigeria, a commercial law practice in Lagos. Our distinguished lecturer was in active legal practice until his foray into politics and election as the Vice President of Nigeria in 2015. Professor Yemi Oshibajo has numerous scholarly publications to his credit. His political career, after the formation of the All Progressive Congress APC, Professor Yemi Oshibajo was tasked with other notable Nigerians in the party with the development of a manifesto for the new political party. The highlights of the roadmap included a free meal school plan and a, con a conditional cash transfer to millions of the poorest in Nigeria. On 17 December 2014, the presidential candidate of the All Progressive Congress, retired General Muhammadu Buhari, announced Osibajo as his running mate and vice presidential candidate for the 2015 general elections. The presidential ticket won the election and were both sworn in on the 29th of May 2015 for the first time. Again, in February 2019, the Buhari Osibajo ticket won the presidential elections for his second term in office starting May 29, 2019. Our distinguished honor lecturer has done a lot of reforms and some charity work. As Attorney General and Commissioner of Justice of Lagos State, our distinguished lecturer was credited with undertaking far-reaching significant judicial reforms in Lagos State, which address critical areas such as judges' recruitment, remuneration, training, and discipline. The reforms also address access to justice for the poor by establishing appropriate institutions in the Office of the Public Defender, OPD, and the Citizens Mediation Center, CMC. Similarly, His Excellency founded the Orderly Society Trust, OSC, a charity involved in an Excel literacy program that aims to provide children in public primary schools with the same level of training in English as is available to their counterparts in private schools. On his 60th birthday, His Excellency launched the Learning Center in Borno State, an initiative of the Northeast Children's Trust. The Northeast Children's Trust is a private sector-led social engineering initiative incorporated in 2017 with a mission to create innovative and transformational sustainable learning ecosystems that will, that will nurture, renew, and empower vulnerable children between ages 5 and 18 years who have been orphaned as a result of insurgency in Northeast Nigeria. This program has provided comprehensive support to 686 orphaned and vulnerable children through accommodation, feeding, quality education, and rehabilitative social psychosocial support. Over 1,000 students have directly benefited from the enhancements to educational infrastructure, such as books, classrooms, ICT systems, wash facilities, amongst others. Our distinguished lecturer has numerous awards, membership of association, and of course, a true Nigerian with several um, traditional honors. His Excellency Professor Yemi Osimbajo has won several awards, 
including State Merit Award 1971, School Prize for English Oratory 1972, the Adeoba Prize for English Oratory 1972 through to 75, the Alliance Prize for Best Performance in History in WAEC in 1973, School Prize for Literature in 1975, and African Statesman Intercollegiate Best Speakers Prize in 1975. He also won the Graham Douglas Prize for Commercial Law in 1979. He is the Grand Commander of the Order of the Niger GCOM, Nigeria's second highest national honor. Our distinguished annual lecturer is a member of the Nigerian Bar Association, the International Bar Associ Association, and the British Institute of International and Comparative Law. He served on the Nigerian Body of Benchers and the Nigerian Council for Legal Education of Nigeria. He was also an independ independent director of Sitting Bank Nigeria and an ethics advisor to the African Development Bank's Board of Directors. His Excellency holds numerous chieftaincy and traditional tattoo titles across the length and breadth of Nigeria. Our distinguished honor lecturer sees a great Nigeria ahead. He believes that if we work together as a nation, we can build, by the grace of God, the Nigeria of our dreams. In a few short years, for him, we need to move with speed, intentionality, and perseverance towards the vision of a prosperous, stable, and secure Nigeria. The chairman of the occasion, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my singular honor and privilege to invite to the podium his Excellency, ably represented here this evening by the Honorable Minister of Labor, the person of Mr. I mean, I beg your pardon, Honorable Dr. Chris Ingege, to deliver the National Institute Distinguished Honor Lecture for 2022 on the theme, Sub-National Level Governance in Africa, Rethinking New Policies, Frameworks, and Institutions. You're welcome, sir. Please bring him up with a big round of applause. Your Excellency, the Governor of the people on the plateau, the plateau state, my very good friend, Governor Bako, Simon Lolong, who is here represented by his uh, able deputy governor. Your Excellency, you're welcome. Chairman of the annual event, and Emir of Kano, His Royal Highness, Andrew Bayero, Chairman of the Alumni of NIFS, Alumni Council, former IGP, Inspector General Police Mohammed, once an IGP, always an IGP. The head of service, civil service of Plateau State, our friend, who received the entourage from the airport. The chairman of the governing board of uh, NIPS and members of the governing board, member Honorable Ariman, who is here with us. Chairman of Council, who is uh, for now the General of General Chief of Defense Staff, Loki Rabo. The Director General, our Chief Host, and his uh, Directing Staff, Senior Fellows, and all other management staff here of the Policy Institute, NIPS, who are also here with us. 
the DG, we, as we rode in here, we saw so many tanks, and more tanks. So we we're wondering. Uh, but when you now clarified, we now know what has happened. So the, the service chiefs, that are, they are your friends. So we want that friendship to continue. Well, those number of tanks we saw there, if they were in Kujo prison, some, something wouldn't have happened there. This one is too much. much sure. No. The distinguished participants of course 44, 44 and their yeah, research fellows, these participants have uh, taken over a very serious topic, <laughs> dangerous topic. Um, but they have done justice to it. From what you presented to the president yesterday, you've done justice to it. And the reply of the president has also done justice to it. So if you turn all the televisions now, radio station, there is one everywhere. Uh, those who take 50 million on pocket, and those who take 50 million and uh, abridge it and uh, cut it down. That is the discussion now. And it's all due to the 44 participants. Cause for, it cause confusion for us. Between the government and the, uh, the government and the governors. <laughs> so, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, friends of the Institute who are here, members of the Fourth Area of the Press, good afternoon to everybody. I stand here on behalf of uh, Mr. Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Professor Yemi Oshibajo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, Grand Commander of the Niger GCUN, who as the DG and the uh, other speakers before me have told you, uh, is uh, a bit indisposed, and so couldn't be with you here for today. But he was with you at the party yesterday, the presidential party. And thereafter, <clears throat> he had to take uh, some rest on uh, advice of the medical people. He couldn't even go for the evening session of uh, the MSME clinics uh, organized by uh, the Ministry of uh, Industry, Trade and Investments, of which he is the chief promoter. Uh, but for today, he had asked me to stand in yeah, you people have been seeing him. He's been coming for your lectures and for your graduation before. So today there's a change. And uh, you won't lose much because I'm going to read his speech. You won't also lose much because we are the same height. He's a... So if you want to see a small man, one is here today, today to represent him. Next time, if I is unable and I'm unable, we'll bring it to five for you. <laughs> or if you want us to add more, we'll bring Oshimole for you. <laughs> because we're in the same club and he's our chairman. Uh, the vice president is the chairman. Uh, Rufai is the secretary general. I'm the treasurer. Small men in government, that's what uh, our association is called. But, but time bomb men, we don't shy away from fights. So chairman of uh, today's occasion, your Highness, the topic is sub-national level governance in Africa. Rethinking new policies, frameworks, and institutions. In the main, that is what people have uh, even researched on and you have done. So from the vice president, he says, I should read this for you and tell you that this is his position. He says, let me start by thanking the NIPS faculty and indeed the entire academic community here for your very kind invitation to me to be your annual guest lecturer 
on this all important topic. For over 40 decades now, the National Institute for Policy and Strategic Studies has been an important part of the national policy making process in our country. Its various contributions through in depth researches by generations of participants on contemporary and emerging issues have greatly enriched policy considerations and developments, not only in Nigeria, but across the African continent. Governance at any level is a complex but practical endeavor with far-reaching implications for the lives and livelihood of the governed. As such, no group of people can afford a situation where governance decisions are taken without the benefit of evidence-based analysis and advice. That is why think tanks like the NIPS remain the crucial and critical nexus to quality research and effective decision making, making your role within the body politics of, a, of the nation a necessary one for its survival. In a federation such as ours, with two fully functional tiers of government, as well as the, uh, uh, the recognized administrative councils at the local level, the role of the subnational governments would always be a topic of public interest. Under the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended, the federal tier of government holds the sov sovereign power of the nation and plays the lead role in governance. But the states and their local governments are entrusted with very important responsibilities such that without consistent efficiency at their respective levels, national development cannot be truly realized. Section 2.1 of the Constitution declares that Nigeria is one indivisible and indissoluble sovereign state. Why Section 2, subsection 2, provides that the country shall be a federation consisting of states and the federal capital territory. Section 3, subsection 6, and section 7, and the subsection there to go further, not only to give recognition to local governments as administrative units of the states, but to guarantee the establishment, the structure, composition, finance, and functions of democratically elected local government councils. See also Schedule 4 of the Constitution, which defines and assigns responsibility to local governments. For this reason, the terminology subnational in our discussion will include not just state governments, but also their local councils. However, why the role of state governments and their scope of authority appear very well appreciated. Local governments remain, and in my view, quite undervalued, needing more attention from all of us. In particular, better funding, better organization, and higher quality of leadership. As we speak, a bill for local government autonomy <clears throat> is striving very hard to pass the threshold of 24 votes, state government votes, required from the state, state House of Assembly, a key milestone towards its passage into law. I believe that efforts are being made through the ongoing constitutional amendment <clears throat> to cede more responsibility for the control and management of resources to local government across the country to reflect our understanding of how crucial it has become for local government to take full charge of their own responsibilities in order to function at optimal capacity. After all, as it is often argued, 
Local government councils are the tire of government, the partitioning of government, compartment of government, closest to the citizens, and is best placed to impact on their lives directly. Same applies to some national entities or administrative units in other African nations, even where they have not adopted the federalist model like we have in Nigeria. Our local communities have always been locally administered, and this transmuted to native authorities during the colonial era. The proximity of local administrative authorities to the populace has always made them better suited for the delivery of basic municipal services. Presumably, and for good reasons, one should expect that they better understand the local economy, that they better understand the local economy, the cultural and political histories, the investment environment, the values of the people, and the moral drivers of behavior in those places. In fact, local or native authorities with their unique composition and functions across ethnic nationalities have always been integral to how African societies become self-organized and are governed. It is no wonder then that the colonial era governments, in spite of the centralizing tendencies and experiences, they literally arrive with, with found it quite compelling to rely heavily on local administrators through the indirect rule, to raise taxes, administer the law, and provide services. In almost all cases, they found it easier and more effective to discharge the most basic functions of governance using the closest administrative structures available to them then. The post-independence states we had in Nigeria that followed were also largely imagined as decentralized societies with responsibilities devolved subnationally. Indeed, the multi-ethnic, multilingual, and multi-religious complexities of our country, Nigeria, demands this as a survival imperative. Unwieldy central bureaucracy had made it likely for resources to be concentrated at the center, whilst creating uncomfortable variances in regional and local developments. This is why the First Republic, by structurally avoiding over-centralization through regionalization, bounded out of the gates with such promise in a way that each region, playing up its competitive advantage to great results, thereby creating vibrant, diversified, and export-oriented economies, driven by heritage sub national competition, which we had in that time. The regions of uh, Namdiazikiwe, Abafemi Awolo, and Sadana of Sokoto. However, the political misadventures and major changes in the economic landscape, such as the discovery of crude oil, centralization of the revenue pool, as well as the incursion of the military with its central command structure subsequently engendered a new move towards the concentration of power and resources at the center. The consequences of this reversal have remained with us even till today. We don't mean these military people sitting here, nah, the other people. You know the people they talk about. Years down the line, sub-national governments local governments in particular, which still retain value as direct mediators between the state and the people, have had that role reduced to the barest political utility. In other words, 
Local governments are now largely regarded as being valuable only to the extent of their ability to organize resources, mobilize votes towards securing power for regional politicians at the center, and, as Mr. Prince said yesterday, to pay only salaries and pocket the rest of the money. However, to retain the policies, frameworks, and institutions that affect the quality of subnational governments in Africa, we must first rethink the political culture that has come to view positions of governance at every level as a means of capturing public resources in the service of narrow interests of the power elites. The poor economic outcomes and disproportionate growth that this political culture has fostered on us is in no way sustainable. It's unsustainable. Our response must therefore be as radical as the demographic shifts and the growing demands for good government that reflect the restless potential of Africans everywhere across this continent, the continent of Africa. In Nigeria, we have to get it right. And get it right as quickly as possible. And in doing that, we have to return to the first principles of yesteryears. One, to use government as an instrument for ensuring democratic representation and delivering public goods, not self-good. Two, to use subnational government as the most effective channel and vehicle for delivering the orderly, functional, and prosperous 21st century communities we so desperately need across Africa now. For us in Nigeria, ratifying the bill that grants local government autonomy, physical autonomy, is indeed a step in the right direction. And we encourage the year to be decided votes from the remaining state houses of assembly to, to be considered in this regard as to be speedily passed so that this can be a reality. The advantages of devolving power to the states and local government are fairly obvious. The issue of security, for example, which has posed a significant challenge in the last few decades, cannot be effectively and consistently tackled with a centralized resourcing security architecture. We have debated on state policing and local government policing for too long. This is Vice President speaking now, not me. Objectors always cite the possibility of abuse as their main reason. That, in my view, is a human factor, which applies to every organ of government. I even said that yesterday. That one belongs to me. If we have the right, if we have the right rulers in place and the right persons in charge, we need not entertain that fear. The proposals for state policing before the National Assembly ought therefore to be attended to with renewed urgency. It is clear that Nigeria is too vast to be effectively policed from the center. At any rate, the practice is already running far ahead of the law, with some national entities across the country establishing various quasi police or paramilitary outfits in response to these security challenges. Are we saying that these outfits cannot be abused? Is the current police structure also resistant to abuse? The answer is no. There is no denying that the nagging issues of terrorism and crime of every hue requires robust networks of actionable intelligence to be decisively contained. The people at the grassroots know the intricacies of their communities better 
They know the geography intimately. They understand the apps and flows of people and the information flow in greater detail than a foreigner. We cannot, therefore, continue to deploy swaths of strangers into relatively unfamiliar terrains and expect them to police effectively. There is almost no federating system in the world that keeps a sensitive issue like policing exclusively at the center. We do not have the manpower or logistic requirement to make this work. It is therefore imperative to let states and local governments be first line in policing and protecting their communities. Let them recruit, train, and equip their own police force. Let them develop a security architecture better suited to the uniqueness of their communities and environment, and let us see what we can learn from each other as we evolve better suited policing practices from one community to another. As earlier indicated, some of the affected regions are already having to rely on local vigilantes to stem the tide. We can get a better handle on this by allowing the federal principles enshrined in the spirit of our constitution run its full gamut so that there is no doubt about the legal structure, powers, and limitation of those entities. There is more to be gained by this than not. The prevailing distrust that has colored conversation around state police and community policing are rooted in political culture that privatizes the instruments of the state, and it is this culture, this mindset, that we must dislodge as we push for and embrace sub-national autonomy. I think it's also imperative to discuss the role of sub-national entities in healthcare. Section 14.2b, subsection 2b of our constitution, 1999, provides that the security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of government. Therefore, securing the welfare of the people must, of course, include guaranteeing, guaranteeing their access to quality health care, irrespective of their situation station and station in life. As issues of personal health can so easily translate to community health, national and even global pandemic, it is no exaggeration to say that healthcare must not be conditioned solely on the wealth of the individual. Furthermore, most healthcare requirements, including the treatment of infectious diseases, psychiatric care, maternal and child health care, immunization, drive, and preventive health, accident and emergency are very local matters that should be dealt with at the first and earliest instance in the closet of the neighborhood. This, in my view, will ensure, this, in my view, will ensure, though requiring government at all levels, especially the states and local government, to play stronger roles in healthcare provision. Our current constitution does not explicitly place health care on the exclusive or concurrent legislative list of responsibilities, leaving the role of states and local government, as far as all this, this all-important issue of health care is concerned, quite ambiguous. If, as constitutional law requires, we interpret this as characterizing health care as a residual matter, residual matter. If something is not in the concurrent and not on the exclusive, it's residual. But if we place health care on residual, it would then seem to exclude the federal government, which readily, for now, appears contrary to practice to be bearing the heavy debt or burden of providing health care. Gleaning some power from its concurrent responsibility, the federal government has established tertiary, tertiary and scientific research institutions, have regulated drugs and poisons, etc., as well as the fundamental objectives of all tiers to ensure 
that the adequate medical and health facilities for all persons. As enshrined again in the 1999 Constitution, Section 17, Subsection 3D, the federal government has been active in establishing health institutions and playing a prominent role in healthcare. Of course, this should by no means be diminished or reversed. In fact, all tiers of government need to do more in all this in this all important field. I think our constitution therefore should be more specific in defining the roles and responsibilities states and local governments can do. This is because states and local governments can do even better with the requisite powers and legitimacy they need to adequately superintend over community health, primary health care for now. State government, hospitals, health insurance and all related responsibilities have not been adequately ad addressed as we speak. Psychiatric and orthopedic care, for instance, are still absent in most localities. A recent report by a consortium, including ONE campaign, National Advocates for Health, Nigeria Health Watch, and Public and Private Development Center, assessing the state of primary health care delivery in Nigeria, revealed that only 19 out of the 36 states and the Federal Capital Territory achieved a score of 56% and above in the areas of immunization, nutrition, and maternal health. In fact, 26 states do not have at least one functional primary health care center, the political ward as needed. I was discussing with the head of service as we were coming, and we're trying to find out the states that have complied and where Plateau is. Plateau is one of those that have complied. So clap for them. The factors that allow for this are multifaceted. But central to this is that we cannot input adequate resources and demand total accountability where we have not fully defined the rules and invested total authority and legitimacy. Management of healthcare systems and the attending resources and the execution of health programs must be fully vested in the states constitutionally. With the Federal Ministry of Health supervising as a resource center and policy center, rather than getting involved in anything that may seem like micromanaging the country's health system. The truth is that any way you look at it, we cannot meet the challenges of the 21st century with unwieldy institutions designed to cater to a vanishing era. We need nimble institutions that are able to anticipate and respond to the issues of the day with creative and proactive agility. Urgent constitutional reforms that devolve power from the center, especially on matters of local concern, are a matter of survival. We are in route, no doubt, but we have to move faster. This is in, in response to the devolution, which we are all talking about. It's not only in uh, security we need devolution. So the Vice President is giving you another example with her case system. Because the people are in the wards, and some wards don't have even one primary health care center. He continues, he says again, what this also means is that as we envisage a significant policy shift 
with regards to greater state and local government autonomy, we must equally and urgently address the manpower and physical frameworks required to ensure that the quality of government at subnational levels rise up to the responsibility that will increasingly fall on them. We don't give them things they cannot utilize or those that will be too much. No framework, no manpower. The idea is that the lower you go in terms of tiers of government, the less the quality of personnel and leadership required is indeed very wrong. People who think that way is wrong. If anything, is the other way around. The lower we go, the better the quality of personnel needed at that level. Quality of government, in this sense, is universally measured by the impartiality of the institutions that exercise authority on behalf of municipal administration. One that translates into the efficient delivery of public goods, inclusive democratic principles, and smart, equitable allocation of resources. Thus, we need, at the local level, top quality individuals who are able to manage resources and implement plans optimally in a way to accelerate development and radically improve the lives of the populace. In pluralistic societies like Nigeria, we are trust in the central government is typically influenced by ethnic and religious affiliations and non-affiliations, it is clear that local authorities are even better positioned to end the people's trust by virtue of their cultural and geographical commonalities. But to sustain this trust, they must also transcend the mere sentiment by actually meeting the demands and needs of the people in the aforementioned regard. If subnational governments prevents, presents more effective channels for guaranteeing better representation and making public services more accessible to the people, as we have argued, then it behooves us to ensure that greater quality representation at that level. So far, democracy at the local level has been half as hard at best. Local government councils are often dissolved at whim and caprices of state governments. Unfortunately, local government election schedules have not been consistently adhered to in many states. And with overwhelming influence of the relevant state government, the fairness has often been suspected not to have played a role in, the, in their elections. There is no state government that conducted an election on that didn't have 100% on. They are very, very intelligent in that aspect. 100 over 100. Mm -hmm. In consequence of the forceful dissolution, sole administrators and cardiac councils have crept exceptionally yes. into our political vocabulary. Using sole administrators and Kateka, chairmen, Kateka, councillors, is not only an anathema, is not accepted as a world government. The, the fact is that governments cannot rise above the quality of the people who administer their policies and drive their visions. Thus, as we seek to improve the democratic and electoral processes at the local level, responsible citizens must also take on the challenge of more radical engagement at the municipal levels of government. People who believe they possess the capacity and integrity, who understand their local communities better than anyone, must rise to the occasion. Indeed, the process of refining and perfecting our democracy must begin at the local level. I refer to the executive council, we always give an example with Alai Shegari, who, be, after being minister at Lagos, came back to Shegari and 
contested council election. That's patriotism to the full. Going by the scope of engagement required, it is arguably easier to win a council election than it is to win a seat into the federal parliament or to win a governorship or presidential election. We therefore need qualified and competent men and women who have passion for serving their communities to throw in their hands in the rain. As a people, we can turn the tide in our immediate communities by refusing to see the political space at the local government level to people whose principal desire for seeking political office is far and worth. That's the vice president speaking. But he doesn't know that no government can concede you, local government can switch your man. He said he will give you House of Earth, or Senate itself. As the devolution of power to some national government continues, a pace across the continent, the theater of development is gradually shifting, and our consciousness and appetite for political engagement must shift with it. We must therefore begin to reclaim the political space to make it reflect the higher values of service and excellence that has traditionally defined our societies. The federal government on this part must continue to effect political reforms that demystify the political process and strengthen citizens' trust in democratic institutions now, more so at the local government level. We must also begin to work to a greater extent with local and international development partners to strengthen the capacity of state government and local government institutions and public administrators to meet the challenge of increased autonomy as well as the demands of the modern world. This may include peer-to-peer -peer learning across municipalities that focus on revenue generation for local economies, public accountability, allocation of development budgets, and enhanced service delivery across agriculture, education, health, water supply, and the development of local solutions to local problems. An independent structure for monitoring performance, rewarding the best, and calling out the laggards will, in this context, insensitize and help to entrench best practices. Furthermore, it is important that we do not hobble local governments by simply making them spending appendages of state government. As we develop power and increase autonomy, we must also ensure that the local authorities possess full policy-making autonomy and are able to develop and drive their own agendas in line with local government needs. In conclusion, it is my firm belief that we must strengthen our sub-national administrative units through a further devolution of powers, be more explicit concerning the functions of each type of government, federal, state, and the administrative local government councils, as well as democratize them and make them real, virile, autonomous units with better control over their own resources. Some nationals must also play a greater role in matters like security, health care, and education. And above all, we must also ensure that we have the right caliber of people elected freely and fairly into local administrative positions. We are headed in the right direction. And that the challenges that will come as we achieve increased autonomy for subnationals will be increasingly met, not by wishing it, but by the determination of Nigerians in every corner of the country who possess the talent, consciousness, selflessness, and knowledge to transform their communities 
that they are given the chance. We have an opportunity in this because by so doing, we are strengthening the local economies, driving healthy competition, and fostering innovation. We, also, we have an opportunity in this to better tackle the security challenges also. The security challenges are here with us for now. We have a better opportunity to allow the best and most qualified of us across the states, across the local governments, to vie for political office and bring their talents and capacity to bear at this most crucial period in the history of our country. Thank you very much for listening, gentlemen. Thank you. Please, can we give him a standing ovation, please, to the Vice President? Your Excellency, since David killed Goliath, right from that time, everyone became afraid of the short man. Uh, at this junction, before we take the vote of thanks from the Director of Research, we have presentations to make to His Royal Highness, the Emir of Kano and also the Vice President of the Federal Republic. In order to do that, may I invite the DG to come forward to make these presentations. We'll start with the presentation to His Royal Highness, the Emir of Kano. Okay, this one is for His Excellency, the Vice President. Thank you very much, the DG and Your Excellency. <laughs> uh, before the Director of Research comes forward to present the vote of thanks, let me recognize Ahmad Adobayero, the Sarikin Dawaki. He is also on the entourage of the Emir of Kano. Please, round of applause for him. Also, Mr. Salas Vem, 
came with the Deputy Governor of Plateau State, the Deputy Chief of Staff. On this note, may I invite the Director of Research, Professor Dung Pam Shah, to present the vote of thanks. Dung Pam Shah is not a Chinese, he is a Nigerian from Plateau State. <laughs> I'm the chairman of the occasion. Um, let me lean on the well-established protocols. Um, we are indeed very grateful for um, this platform that has been created um, for us to have reflections on this issue um, this evening. Um, I want to thank the distinguished annual lecturer in the person of the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Professor Yemi Oshibanjo, who has um, ably and wonderfully requested the Honorable Minister of Labor and Employment, Dr. Chris Ngige, to represent him. Um, sir, we are very grateful for um, presenting the Vice, Chance, uh, Vice President's um, speech. A very progressive and very revolutionary uh, speech for that matter. Um, revolutionary in the sense that um, it has uh, ingredients that, if implemented, will move this country forward. We note with great um, attention, the call for a democratic decentralization of the subnational uh, level administrative structures. For me, that is revolutionary. The call for um, a transparent recruitment process into the local government institutions is also revolutionary. And I think that if we pay attention to this, in addition to all the uh, recommendations and implementation strategies that were laid on the table yesterday by the participants, uh, we are going to move forward as a country. So, sir, we want to thank you very much for um, this delivery. Let me also um, recognize and appreciate the representative of the Secretary to the, uh, uh, to the federal government in Nigeria, uh, I'm told that um, he's here with us. Please, can we? Yes, can you stand up for recognition, sir? Please, let's ap appreciate him. Thank you very much for coming, sir. Let me also recognize the, I mean, appreciate the, um, the governor of Plateau State, uh, his representative, uh, my vice chancellor before, and uh, also my, supervis uh, my supervisor at the master's level. Professor Sonitio then, uh, sir, you're welcome. Uh, Prof came with uh, a delegation from the uh, Plateau State. Uh, members of the delegation, you're welcome. Let me also thank um, the chairman of the occasion, the, His Eminence al Haji Aminu Ado, uh, the Emir of Kano and his delegation. Uh, sir, we want to appreciate you uh, for accepting to uh, come down to the National Institute to uh, preside over this, this session. We indeed acknowledge your contribution to the discourse um, by calling on the decentralization, more decentralization of the local government system in Nigeria. And your call that no one should be left behind. Uh, this is in line with the SDG's uh, huge call uh, for the whole world to recognize. So we appreciate you, sir. We appreciate the, um, the, the representative of the Bongom Jos, the Atta Ateng of Ghana Uri. Uh, sir, we want to thank you for coming. 
and um, extend our appreciation to the Bongom Jaws. There are many military officers here present. Yes. The um, military officers here present, uh, very top military officers here present. Uh, SARS, you are, are quite welcome, um, and also we appreciate your presence here. We want to thank the uh, chairman of the uh, Board of Governors and all the other members that are here. Uh, we appreciate you for the leadership you provided for the, to the National Institute in various dimensions, so we appreciate you. Um, the Director General of the National Institute, uh, 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 Minister Sir, when you say you have a, 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 a committee of short people in government, uh, this one is a deviation from the central tendency. So if I was in government, probably I would be the... Okay, you said you're the treasurer, so I would be the financial secretary. Uh, so... <laughs> or you said you would deny me membership. <laughs> uh, so our DG is a deviation from the central tendency. Um, so we want to appreciate you, uh, DG, sir, for giving us the uh, leadership uh, you've, you've given to the National Institute since you came on board. Uh, my Vice Chancellor, President Vice Chancellor of the University of Jos, I mention him very specially for two reasons. One, for something that he is currently doing for the National Institute, and also for allowing me to come here for the periods that I've been here. So you're welcome to see. And there are spiritual leaders here present. I've seen the chaplain of the Chapel of Salvation. Uh, Sai, so welcome. And the other, uh, from the other faiths, um, I've not seen him, but I'm sure he's somewhere here. Uh, you're also welcome, sir. Uh, the Gonroy of Guru, sir, you're, you're, you're welcome. Um, da Patrick Mandung, uh, he has uh, periodically interacted with the community here at the National Institute. And I think um, he has done very well in keeping the, the peace uh, between the Institute and also uh, the community. The president of the Alumni Association, um, Annie, um, uh, IGP, Mohamed Sa, uh, we want to thank you very much for always being with us here at the National Institute and for hosting the great occasion yesterday. Uh, we appreciate you. The management of the Institute uh, Professor Paramala Memenai and Dr. Uh, Maman and the Brigadier General uh, Udaya uh, MNI as well. We want to thank you for uh, providing assisting the DG in leading the Institute uh, to uh, this height and we are going to do much more uh, than we have uh, been doing in the previous um, sessions. I want to thank the principal officers of the National Institute uh, who have um, played significant roles in ensuring that uh, this session you know, has gone on well and by providing the various services that are required. We thank the directing staff who have uh, taken on their shoulders uh, the responsibility of presiding over various sessions and various models and various uh, tours and several other things that um, you have done through this session with the participants. We want to appreciate you, Sars and Mars, and um, yes, please, let's appreciate them. So when sometimes you are angry, it was for a just cost, and I'm sure the participants will um, recognize this. We thank also senior fellows and fellows of the National Institute for supporting the, uh, the process of uh, this set. Um, you've read manuscripts, you've uh, internally examined uh, participants, and you've also supervised their work. And so we want to appreciate you. Senior fellows, please appreciate them. Um, participants of um, Site 44, uh, 2022. Uh, this is one of the greatest um, sites uh, since I came 2020 that I've met.
Ah, this one is turning to a political club. Well, um, you've done very well. Uh, you've related well. You've connected uh, very well. And um, I've seen the very, very bright sides of, of, of all of you. Um, your questions and your contributions um, inside the plane, I mean, inside the hall here during plenaries. Um, some of you that we traveled together, and um, those of you we supervised, and a number of you we met at several fora. Um, I think you've done very well, and God bless you all. So, as you clap, remember tomorrow that you need to give back to the community that has produced you right now. I didn't hear an amen. Thank you. Let me appreciate um, quite a number of our colleagues and uh, visitors uh, that came. Um, let me recognize uh, one of us who finished in last year, Sec 43, uh, Mr. Tonya Cole, MNI. So we are familiar with the political terrain and we know what you're doing and the Lord Almighty will lead you to the destination he reserves for you. Let me also um, recognize the Comrade Isaremu. Is Comrade here? Ah, uh, okay. Ah, uh, Comrade Isaremu MNI the Director General of the Michael Imodu Institute of Labor Studies, Ilorin. Comrade, you're welcome. And also, uh, Dr. Aminu, um, I guess your essay? Yes, you're welcome. Let me also uh, appreciate quite a number of persons that are here, the, the spouse of the, the Director General of the National Institute, um, uh, thank you for coming, and all spouses that have uh, come together with either husbands or wives, uh, we really appreciate you for uh, at this time. Um, since we do not have um, a lot of time here, I will um, say that distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I'm our invited guest, um, I want to appreciate you for finding time to come to the National Institute to grace this occasion. Uh, there's usually a group that we often um, forget to thank. I call them the food soldiers, those who have worked in the restaurants, those who have been driving us um, from one place to the other, and also um, are those who have been keeping the environment very clean. And we want to thank all of you for uh, doing this work during uh, this year. So let me stop here and um, thank, uh, but thank the um, citation reader, uh, Mrs. Um, Sandra Abo, for doing a wonderful job. Sandra, thank you very much. So on behalf of the uh, members of the Board of Governors and the Director General of the National Institute, uh, management, um, the directing staff, uh, fellows, and all the uh, participants, um, thank all of you for finding time to attend this um, occasion. God bless you all. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dung Pam Shah. Uh, before we take the national anthem, a couple of announcements. The participants would accompany His Royal Highness to commission a project at the mosque after the group photograph. Let me apologize to the general officer commanding the third armored division. Earlier on, I said you are in charge of a brigade. Thank you, sir. Uh, can we please rise for the national anthem?
the group photograph here. Here. In front here. Hey. Downside. 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 Hey, Agabana. have the group photograph standing please please those of you in front can you please leave the front line those in front please leave the front line please those on the front line thank you very much all right so let's let's be ready to take are we ready? Okay, so we're taking place. All right, are we done? Thank you very much, sir.